book of Exodus, chapter 3. Don't you pray for us tonight as we bring you the message. Feel the Lord laid on our heart. And we'll begin reading with verse number 1, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 1. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Somebody next to you don't have a Bible, you might want to share yours with them. We can read this scripture together. Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 1. Exodus chapter 3, verse number 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land that lot and large, unto a land that floweth flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Now I want to bring you a message tonight on the subject, the burning bush or a church on fire. Let's bow our heads while we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this day. Thank you, Father, for our health and our strength and all the many blessings, God, that you've given us. Our Father, tonight our heart rejoices. God, that we're able to come to the house of God, worship you in spirit and in truth. We're glad for the Bible, the Word of God. We're glad for the songs of Zion. We're glad that we have brothers and sisters to fellowship with. We thank you, Father, for your presence most of all in our midst. I pray, our Father, as we look into your precious, holy, infallible, eternal Word, God, that you'd open our minds, open our hearts, open our ears of understanding. Dear God, that we may preach the Word of God, Lord, without fear, without favor, or without compromise tonight. Our Father, tonight we pray that you would do what needs to be done in this service. Set our church on fire for the glory of God. Help us, Lord, to be as a burning blaze for lost men, women, boys, and girls that they may find heat and warmth and light to come to Jesus. Help us now, our Father, to preach this message that just where be pleasing to you and bring honor and glory to your name. Save that one which is lost here tonight. Help that one which may be walking afar off or a guilty distance and help them to come back to the Lord and get things straightened out. And whatever you do for us, we'll praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I read to you a very familiar story tonight in the book of Exodus chapter 3. And I want to take this subject tonight, the story of Moses and the burning bush and bring you a message on the burning bush 
or a church on fire. Now I realize that tonight that we're living in a day when there are many, 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 many church builds and it has the name church on the outside with a, t a steeple sticking up or a cross or something on the outside, pretty bricks and nice windows or stained glass or something like that that says we're having a church. And I also realize when Moses was out there on the desert, there was a lot of bushes, except just for one of them was different from all the rest of them. It was on fire. I believe tonight that the greatest need of our churches is to be on fire for God. And so I want to talk to us a little while tonight about the burning bush and use it as a type and a picture of a church on fire. Now I want you to notice several things about this tonight and may the Lord help, uh, help us as we do. Now you'll notice first of all that the bush burned with fire. The Bible said over there in Exodus 3 and verse 2, in a flame of fire, the bush burned with fire. Now the Bible tells us that the bush was on fire. It wasn't no ordinary bush. It was a bush that was on fire. Now the word fire there could represent two aspects. First of all, it represents a church on fire in the sense that me and you say, let's get fired up. And then it also represents a church being on fire of a church passing through the fire of trials and troubles and temptation. Let's think just for a moment about a church on fire. I remember uh, the church that I got saved in, down at Nebo Baptist Church, Nebo, North Carolina. I passed by that church every day of my life for about, I guess, ten years. Every day when we'd go to school, I'd go right by that church. You know, when I looked at that church, it looked just like it to me. And nothing stuck out, nothing in Blessed me very much. I thought, well, there's just another church. And I passed by that church oh, hundreds of times, I imagine. I, my wife, which, uh, which was my girlfriend back then, when she lived out that road, and I didn't have to pass that road going to school, and I passed it going to her house every day. So two or three times a day, I passed that church building. And me and a bunch of boys used to camp out. And we called it camping out. All we do is just walk around and just uh, fool around all that long and dribble the ball all over me both. And we went out there and we'd camp out. And we'd go up on the back steps of that church building, and we'd sit there and just talk for hours and hours and hours. Never did it really dawn on me that that was God's house that I was around. It just didn't have that much effect on me. And brother, I went down there to that church and I noticed that uh, it didn't, you know, it was just a brick building as far as I was concerned. But one day, I went into the store and my cousin worked at that store said, Daddy, we're having a revival. I wish y'all would come. And when she said that, there was a little spark got on the inside of me. And lo and behold, I found out that one of my friends had got saved on the first morning of the revival. And lo and behold, I found out the next night that another one of my friends got saved and that another one of my friends got saved. And suddenly, I realized that was not just a building. That wasn't no just any ordinary building with uh, mud between some bricks. But uh, that church got on fire. And when that church got on fire, it attracted my attention. And I began to have a, a, a little uh, curiosity on the inside of me. I thought, my goodness, I'm going to find out what this thing is. You know, when Moses out there walking on that road, he probably passed a thousand bushes just like this little bush. I tell you, there wasn't nothing special about it. There's only one thing that made that bush different from all the rest of them. That bush was on fire. And Moses Moses said, I'll turn aside and see this great thing. And he began to look at it. But did you know tonight? That, you know, that, I heard a preacher say one time, any old bush will do. And that's the truth. As long as the bush is on fire. The bush has got to be on fire. You know, I'm just a high brother. The bush has got to be on fire. A church on fire is the right kind of church. I don't care how much thicker carpet we've got. I don't care how much money you've got in the offering or what your attendance may be. 
say, if the fire is not there, there'll be no warmth, there'll be no heat, there'll be no soul saved. We need the fire. We need the fire. And the church needs to be on fire for God. And if our church ain't on fire, we ain't doing what God wants us to do. Gotta be on fire for God. I know some churches that used to be on fire. And the devil come by and throw the water hose on them. But I like to took a spell when y'all sung that song a while ago. He's tried and the flame has stood, but it's never gone out. It's never gone out. I want to tell you, brother, the Lord set a fire in my soul at Nebo Baptist Church, April 18th, 1972, that's flickered a many a time. And the devil's made it down the coal sometime, and the devil's made it down just some old hot red coals, but thank God, the fire has never gone out. It's still burning out, thank God, and it's still alive, and it's still well. The fire has never gone out. We need a church on fire. Oh, Moses, he went by there and it got his attention. A church on fire will get people's attention. Oh, we try everything else under the sun. You can get them in with cheeseburgers and run them off with hot dogs. But a church on fire will grab the people in. We can have a cantata and it won't do much good. We have a, a play or something else, but if God don't set it on fire, then nobody won't get drawn in. So if you deny it about this thing burn, brother, this bush burn, you wouldn't have half as much trouble getting some of these mamas and daddies and brothers and sisters, and young people to church, if the church is on fire. That'll get them in quicker than anything. And I tell you something else, when they get in, they'll stay there. I tell you, these days, you have to beg and you almost get down on your knees, get people to come to church first time you say something they don't like, then they quit. You can't keep them once you get them. If the church ever gets on fire, they get put in just right. They'll be there. Amen. Now, if you got born in the fire, you don't like to smoke. Amen. I know a lot of people that got born in the fire, and the church is dead at 4 o'clock, and cold as a block of ice, and they don't like the smoke. If you've ever been around the fire, you'll never be happy with the smoke. I want to say tonight, brother, we need some churches in this town on fire for God. Moses didn't set that thing on fire. He just looked and said that thing was a burning. And he said, Lo, I'm going to turn aside and see this thing. That's the way to get the people's attention. The church on fire. Years ago, I read a story about how Billy Summer used to tell about how this in a certain town, there was a church there and, the, and they had an old a famous atheist that sat down to the store every day. And his, he was well known for his unbelief and his infidelity. And brother, he'd cuss God and cuss the church, cuss the preacher, didn't have no respect for the Bible. He was just a flat unbeliever. And then one day, the local church building caught on fire. And everybody in the town, they had the fire department out, and people was running with buckets and hoses going to put the fire out. And brother, was walking running up through there, and it just so happened that the town atheist and the church deacon was running right side by side. And he looked over at that old atheist the deacon did, and he kind of made a little smile. Lord. He said, this is the first time I've ever seen you running to go to church. And the atheist looked back and said, yeah, this is the first time I've ever seen the church on fire. Now I want to say tonight, my dear friend, you won't see a lot of them come. They won't come if there's no fire. They won't come if there's something not a burning. Now I ain't talking about a bunch of wildfire. Now I ain't talking about some of emotional stuff. You pop and prime in the flesh. Now I'm talking about real fire that comes from God and that burns burn and you can't contain it. The fire that never goes out. That's the kind that we need. Our church tonight needs to be on fire for God. I want you to know the Bible says that that bush burned with fire. In a flame of fire, the bush burned with fire. That's the second part about that, uh, that fire is that a judgment fire. And the Bible said in verse 3, Moses said, it didn't really amaze him that it was on fire. What amazed him was it didn't burn up. That's what blew his lid. 
I mean, he said, I've seen a bush on fire before. I picture it being like a little, uh, like them little bushes you got out there in the yard with no leaves on it. Boxwood. I picture it looking like that. A little round bush with no leaves on it. And just old drakes. And just a burning up a storm, but yet not being consumed. It didn't turn into ashes. It didn't turn into dust. It didn't disintegrate. I want you to know, it was not consumed. And did you know the church is that way tonight? The church has been through the fire, brother. I want you to know, this, our church here is only five and a half years old. But brother, we've had a taste of the fire. And I ain't talking about that holy fire. I'm talking about the trials of fire. Where the Bible said over in the book of Peter, that the trying of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be trying with fire may be found under the praise and honor of the glory of God at His appearing. Now, I want to say tonight that bush burned, but the bush didn't burn up. I tell you, a true church, a real church, will burn sometimes, but it won't consume it. I remember the Hebrew children in Daniel, they got thrown in the fire. You know what happened to them? All the fire burned off of them is what they will put on them. You know them guys, they bound their hands, they bound their feet, and throw them in the fire, and all the fire burnt was in things over their hands and things over their feet. And when they came out of that, their hair wasn't even singed. And they came out of that, you couldn't smell no smoke on their clothes. And they went through the fire, and there's a man in there with them. If you got one of them new Bibles, it says, A son of the gods. But if you got the right Bible, it says that was the Son of God. Yeah, with him. Capital S, capital G. Yeah. I want to say tonight, brother, the church went through the fire, and the church came through the fire. The bush burned, but it was not consumed. The bush burned, but was not consumed. I want to say tonight, you listen, there ain't but one organization in this world that God has promised to bless and God has promised that the gates of hell won't prevail against. Just one. Just one. Just one. You better get help with that group because everything else is doomed for failure. Everything else will go down. I want to tell you tonight, the Lord did not say, upon this rock I'll build my club and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Lord didn't say that. The Lord did not say, upon this rock I'll build my lodge and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He didn't say that. You know why? The gates of hell will prevail against those outfit. The Lord did not say, upon this rock I'll buy organization and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me tell you what he said. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. You say, what is the church? Born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. It ain't the Baptist necessarily. It ain't the Methodist. It's not the Presbyterian. It's those that are lost in his blood. You say, why are you a Baptist? There ain't nothing wrong with going first class. But that uh, baby and the Baptist don't make me a Christian. Amen. Now thank God I became a Christian before I ever became a Baptist. Amen. The Lord got me before they did. Amen. If he hadn't, I'd have been another dead Baptist. Amen. But I'm glad tonight that I know that I belong to an organism and not an organization. Amen. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That word church means ecclesia. Called out assembly. Called out from the world, set apart, sanctified by God, and on our way to be with Him one day. The bush did not burn. I want you to notice secondly tonight, let's talk back at the first. The bush was created by God. You know who made this bush? God did. 
Bible said in Exodus or, or Genesis 1 29, and God said, Every herb bearing seed and every tree. John 1 3 says, All things were made by Him. So God made this bush. Moses didn't make it. They could accuse him of making it, but he didn't make it. He just walked along one day and there it was. He didn't make that bush. God made the bush. Now, I want you to know there's a lot of people that thinks a bunch of preachers got together and thought up a church and just made up a church and it was their idea in heaven and hell and they wrote the Bible to scare people and get their money. But I want you to know tonight, but we didn't make the church. God made the church. He said upon this rock, I will build my church. He builds it. It's His church. Just like that was God's birth. The church is created by the Lord. I will build my church. I want you to know, brother, the church was created by God. The church is owned by the Lord. And the church is the place where you ought to be. If anything, if any organization or any club or any outfit is more important to you than in and God's house, there's something wrong in your heart. I tell you tonight, you ought to think it's important to come to church. And some people don't even think it's important to come to Sunday school. They don't learn at all. You know that much. Come next Sunday and we'll let you teach. We'll all sit down and listen. They don't think it's important to come back Sunday night. If absence makes the heart go fonder, I know a lot of people that really do love their church. Amen. God made a church. They kidded me down there at Brother Ford's. Of course, they really kidded me. What happened? Uh, Brother Ronnie and Sutton, some of them guys was preaching, and Buck called on me to preach. And I was scared to death. The church was full. And I got up there and he said, uh, we've been up to Danny's castle. And he was kind of making a joke and making a joke out of it and telling all the girls snake of a thing. And what really embarrassed me when I got up there to preach, the pulpit was made something like this. And had a little thing here to put your Bible on. And they had one of these things that come out like this and down and out like this and down. And I got to preaching in a big way. And all of a sudden, I do like I do here and slam my hand down on the pulpit. And I went, wham! And that thing broke all to pieces. <laughs> it just fell over in the floor. I like to die. My face got red. All the girls started laughing. I looked over the Mac Ford and his face was red as this carpet. And I didn't know what to do. I picked it up and handed it to him. <laughs> and just kept on preaching. They said, I don't know about them North Carolina preachers. Coming here and beating up a pulpit and tying everything down. I just don't know about that outfit. They said, I know that. How them guys do that, you know, with their hand, all that kung fu, judo, those kind of things. And it was about two days the day before we left. They got the pulpit fixed. The man bored some holes and put some screws in it. But the point I was trying to make was that Brother Mac talked about Danny's castle. And I know what Brother Mac meant. Brother Mac knows that this is not my church. The Lord's church. If it's mine, it sure wouldn't be as good a shape as it's in tonight. If it was mine, man, I would ruin it. But it's God's church, and He is building it. That's why I just want to get out of the way, Lord. Whatever you want to do, you just do it. But if you'd have just took off preaching a while ago, I'd have said, Amen, Lord. Help yourself. I ain't going to interfere because it's God's church. I don't own it. You don't own it. Nobody else owns it. I want you to know it's God's church. And it's brother. He was created by God. But we're living in a day when people just about cut out their Sunday night services. And there, I know I, this church is around here just has it once in a while. And I mean, brother, that's bad. One congregation got so small and it dwindled down so little that when the preacher said, Dearly beloved, the lady on the front row thought he was proposing to her. <laughs> She's only in the church. This guy wrote a thing out and he said, he put an article in the paper. And the article was, send them some reasons why you don't go to church. 
So, they put sin in their reasons. One of them give this reason, one of them give that reason, one of them give another reason. They sent in several eight reasons why they didn't go to church. Now, when he got that paper, he simply made one little transaction. Every time the word church appeared, he took it out and put in the word movies. That's all he did. He didn't do anything to the way they worded it. He didn't do anything to their answer. All he did was substituted the word movies for the word church. When he got through and printed it, here's the way it sounded. Number one, why I don't go to the movies? and he ain't no better than I am. The second one, the next one says, there's many good people out of the movies that are in the movies, so what's the use of me going? The next one was, they took me to the movies when I was little, and I go up and said I was never going back. You ain't never heard nobody talk that dumb, have you? No, just about church. And we as Christians will swallow that junk hook, line, and shirt and act like that's a good excuse. No, there ain't no good excuse for not being in God's house when you're able and when it's affordable to you. And listen, folks, there's people over in other countries, there's people over there that would honestly, honestly give weak food nearly to be able to come and be in a service like we've had here tonight. They love it. I mean, they'd give their right hand on most to be able to come and just see these boys get up there and sing. And her sister shout the place uh, 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 the roof off of the house. They love to see it. They'd give anything to see it. But yet here we sit in God's house. we saved on our way to heaven. Our bellies are full. Our bodies are warm. Our houses are dry. Oh, we ought not to forsake the assembly of ourselves to get as the manner of some is. So the bush was created by God. Next thing I want you to notice about this burning bush was that God's presence was in the bush. God's presence was in the bush. How do you know? The Bible said in verse number 5, God called to Moses out of the midst of the bush. Moses walking down through there. There's about 10,000 bushes out there in the desert. But there's only one of them that God was in. That made it special. And all of a sudden he heard a voice saying, Moses! Moses! You know why he didn't turn to this over here? He wasn't prejudiced. He was just wanting to hear the one where God was in. I mean, you can't open your mouth these days without offending somebody. You know, the, the blacks got their rights, the women got their rights, and now the gays are wanting their rights. Everybody's got to have their rights. And anytime you say, oh, you're prejudiced, oh, you're, you're a bigot, oh, you're narrow-minded. Brother, you know why Moses walked at this one bush? He wasn't prejudiced against all the rest of them. He did it because that's one God was in. And God's presence was in the bush. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in the bush. Now if you'll study that angel of the Lord throughout the Old Testament, most of the time it's an appearance of the Lord Himself in the Old Testament. And God Himself, the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament, appeared to Moses in that bush. And it got His attention. And He said, What in the world? I'm going to turn aside and see this great sight of bush that is burning and yet not consumed. Soon. He recognized that God's presence was in that bush. I want you to know tonight, friends, that the Lord's presence is also in the church. That's where God is. That's where God is. God's not in the moose and the goose and the Kiwanis to let loose and all the rest of them, the ducks. Now, I know those organizations sometimes do some good, but God ain't in them. And those are no substitute for the church. This bush had God in it. That's why it got Moses' attention. Hey, if a church ain't got God in it, 
It don't need to go out of business. It's already out. You hear me? There's a lot of them that have service every Sunday. It's already out of business. Ichabod, the Spirit, has departed. Tonight, you say, well, I'm afraid the Lord will depart from us. As long as you honor Him and love Him and serve Him and put Him first and believe His Word, He ain't going to forsake you, brother. No, no. You say, I went to church three weeks in a row and I ain't felt the Lord's presence. Well, have you ever thought that it might be you? I mean, I know you're super spiritual, but has that ever crossed your mind? I mean, I know it probably ain't right, but there is a slight, little, bitsy, teeny, weeny possibility that something might be wrong with you. Because God ain't went nowhere. I know some people that if their favorite group ain't a singing, and if their favorite preacher ain't a preacher, they're just dead and sour and old, like they've been eating persimmons before they come to church. They're like they only strike off their own box. Like them matches, they won't strike unless they're on their box. And you know, they got preacher religion. Or they got singer religion. Or they got denominational religion. I want you to know, I remember one time, you know the Lord at some of the strangest times. Now there's a lot of people sitting in there a while ago that you wanted to shout when everybody else is shouting. You said nothing, boy, I'd like to shout. I'd like to shout. I'd like to shout. But that ain't usually when the Lord will put it on you. The Lord will put you right downtown somewhere. In a grocery store. One time I was in a church singing in the choir. And uh, it was, I mean, you know, it, it, was a, it was a nice place. But it wasn't what you'd say, on fire. And the choir was singing, you know, and it was kind of cold and dead. And I said, well, it don't make no difference. If they don't want to enjoy it, that's their business. I'm just going to enjoy it. So I got to see and I looked at the word. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not my Lord was crucified. I got to thinking about that. And while I was singing, them words started getting real to me. And boy, I felt it coming up. It went boop, 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 and I went, pushed it back down. I said, I can't do that. They don't believe in that here. They, they're not used to that here. And I said, I'm going to be quiet. And I started thinking about, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to my hand. And it went, blah, 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 and pushed it back down. And I quenched the Spirit. And it done that two or three times. If I'd have done what I wanted to, I'd have cut loose all over that place. But I held it back and quenched the Spirit. But that's the way you know that you've got the real fire inside of you. If the only time you can ever have God's presence is when you're in a big crowd with everybody else is shouting and everybody else has got it, I would begin to wonder whether or not I really had the real thing. One time I was asking the Lord to do something for me. I'll tell you what it was. I was trying to borrow some money. And I, I was, I had, I'd been saved about two years, I guess. And man, was I ever in debt. And I, I, Daddy told me. I didn't have enough sense to listen. He said, son, you can't borrow your way out of debt. And that's the truth, you know it? Young people, they go buy money to pay the bills. And buy. You can't buy your way out of debt. That's like trying to dig yourself out of a hole. The more you dig, the deeper you're going down, brother. And you got interest and you got all them payments, and it sounds good. Oh, I can get all my bills in one. My payment won't be but $120 a month, and then I ain't going to have no bills. It sounds good, don't it? But you know what? You, next time you go to town, you say, well, since we don't owe but 120 a month now, I believe we can afford this. And I can make that little 120 a month. Well, we'll add that on there, too. And you go to Sears, and you go to uh, Carolina Tire, and I hope I might be some of your kin folks. That's just the first thing that popped in my mind. Or you go to uh, some of the place department, sir. You go to some of those places, and you try to borrow. Well, that's what I was trying to do. And the Lord had mercy on me, because I was in a mess. 
And it don't look good for a preacher not to pay his bills. And I said, Lord, please help me. And the Lord got me out of the mess that I got myself into. He's, he does that often for us sometimes. And I prayed. And I went up out of the bank on Friday. And I said, man, he's going to tell me. He's going to tell me if I can get the money. And I went up there on Friday evening. And the man said, uh, well, we'll run this to our computers and check your credit. You come back Monday and we'll let you know. That was the longest weekend I'd ever spent. Saturday seemed so long. Sunday seemed so long. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And I said, Lord, Lord, are you going to do it? Are you going to let me have that money? Lord, I need it. And Lord, I'll pay my bills off and fill it up. I, I ain't going to go out here and get myself in a mess like that again. And so the, the next day, I had to go up there about 10 o'clock. Now I was out that morning and I was mowing the grass. And brother, I was getting the mowing grass. I never will forget it. I was going back and forth across my front yard. I made two or three lines there. And I was praying while I was mowing the grass. And all of a sudden, while I was mowing the grass, the answer came. You say, what did it sound like? Well, I don't know how to explain it, but somehow or another God spoke to me and He said, it's all right. You got it. And brother, I knew right then I like this had a shouting spell. And I thought a lot of times about that. If you can shout when you're mowing the grass, it's a good sign you may either save a crazy one. And I said, I ain't crazy, so I must be saved. If you can shout when you're ironing the clothes, then you got the real thing. If you can shout when you spill the milk in the floor, and the oatmeal turns over, and the stew boils over, and the bed gets burnt, if you can still shout, you must have the real thing. Anybody can get all psyched up with everybody else and shout. But if you can shout when you're alone, say, God, even though it's going bad, I love you. And I'm going to see you one day. That's a good sign you got the real thing. So this bush, it was there. And I did get the money. The Lord answered the prayers and worked out all out. That's so you wouldn't stay wondering about that while I went on with the message. And the Bible tells us about this bush. That it was a bush that was created by God and that God's presence was in the bush. Amen. You know what I said? God's presence was in the bush. God's presence was not found in Moses' tent. God's presence was not found in Moses' living room. God's presence was found in the bush. I want to tell you where you're going to find God's presence in the 20th century. You're going to find it in His church. About 10, 11 years ago, there was what, what we know as the Jesus people made a sweep across this nation. And everybody, all the hippies wanted to be a Christian. And we said, yeah, man, everything's cool. We're going to smoke pot and we love Jesus. And they'd take people down to the ocean back in the middle of the night. And all kinds of such a stuff as that. And somebody came to him and said, don't you people go to church? Oh, no, we don't go to church. The church is too old, old formal. Got too many old rules. And we don't want somebody up there preaching and hollering at us. So we sat around on the beach and crossed our legs and uh, we just wear our old floppies, filthy, nasty outfits and study our living Bibles and we just have us a time. Now, one wrong thing wrong with a crowd like that. You notice they didn't last long, didn't you? That you don't see much of the Jesus movement nowadays. The ones that are still in religious outfits are on these extremist groups up in the mouth somewhere. But you don't hear or see too much. I call them hypocrites. That's what there was. You don't never hear. They come and they go. Other groups down through the years have come and they've gone. But the old church is still around. Some of my friends, when I started, uh, the Lord moved on their hearts to start this church. They said, now you ain't going to go the old Baptist tradition, are you? And I said, what do you mean by that? They said, Sunday school, Sunday morning. Preaching service, 
11 o'clock. Preaching, sir. That's too, too traditional. Don't go by those old traditions. Put carpet all over the ceiling. Have some psychedelic lights come on. Sit around in a big circle and chair. And they said, oh, don't have no wings that sort. Have, have, do a little different. Don't conform. It just kill them. See, still had that generation gap with rebel attitude in them. And it just killed them to think that the old people were smarter than they was so they would conform to the old people's beliefs. But thank God the Lord showed me one day. I said, I'll tell you something, sir. It was an old fashioned Baptist church is shaped just like this with lights on like this with a preacher preaching that had the lights on when I got saved. And they had the lights on when most of you got saved. And mother, I tell you what, if an axe or a chainsaw cut the trees down, I trade it off for something else. If it's doing the job, stick with it. Amen? I'm going to tell you, the old preaching of the old book and the old way of singing in the choir and singing the songs of Zion in the prayer room and the old has done the job all these years. We don't need another way. There's too many people in this day and time trying to they're always wanting to do something. Organize a Bible study. Organize this. Organize. But the problem is they're bypassing the local church and God bypasses them. It can't be done. It can't be done. God burned in the bush. Yeah, and I'm not saying that you can't take a group out here and have God's praise. That's how God starts churches. But it's always... Churches. I hope you're listening. He didn't start a club. He didn't start a PTL or 700. He didn't start this or that. You can't show no one the Bible where Jesus died for anything but a church. He's not coming back for anything but a church. And if you don't like it, that's tough. That's what he says. Maybe you need to hear it. Not only that, I want you to notice also, brother, that the church or the bush was a holy place. The bush was a holy place. How do you know, brother Danny? The Bible said in verse 5 of uh, Exodus chapter 3, he said, Take your shoes off, Moses, for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground. God said, Moses, this bush and all this ground around it is holy ground. Take his off. And Moses had to take off his shoes. It was holy ground. The Bible tells us it was sanctified. You know what holy means? Holiness is not a denomination. You know, when you miss it, some people say, I know this and I say, you better believe it. I'll be back slid for what? You better have some holiness. Holiness is not a denomination. Holiness is a state and a way of life. The way a person lives and conducts themselves. Set apart for God. Sanctified. You know what the word sanctified means? So this watch was over here. And I said, I'm going to take that watch out of that bucket of watches. And I'm going to set it over here. And it's going to be my watch. And it's going to be used for nothing else except what I want it to. That's what sanctification is. You didn't hear what I said now, did you? You say, well, I liked you till you said that. Well, maybe you need to get some doubt on that. Some people are always getting mad at what the preacher says that they don't agree with. They'll be the first to tell you that they're not perfect, but they really think they are. I know people, we got people here in our church. They say, well, I'm not perfect, but yet they think they are. Anything you disagree with them on, they're right and you're wrong. They say, I'm not perfect, but they think they are. I'll tell you something, brother. I don't agree with myself on everything. I'll say something sometimes and say, that ain't right. My mind will start debating, going back and forth, and I'll compare scriptures and everything. Listen, there ain't no graduates walking around down here. 
There ain't no know-it-alls walking around down here. You may know how people that think they know it all, but they don't know nothing what they ought to know in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And so tonight, brother, the bush was a holy place. Now I want to say tonight, I know that paneling is no different, actually, than the paneling that goes around the worst honky-tonk in North Carolina. I know that. I got enough sense to know that this wood that we stand on and walk on here tonight is no different from the wood that goes up the beer joints or the moonshine steel. I know that. But there's just something about something that's set apart and dedicated to God that lets you know that this is God's place. Now I want to say tonight that every piece of this paneling, we prayed every piece of that ceiling before it went up, every stick of wood, every bit of grass on this property, it belongs. It belongs to God. It belongs to Him, and therefore it's holy ground. Therefore, you ought, to, you ought to be careful how you treat it. You ought to be careful how you let your kid treat it. If He told Moses to take his shoes off, some of you ought to keep your kids' shoes off the back of them pews. You say, these are sorry pews. They wouldn't be that sorry if you'd keep them young'uns off of them. <laughs> keep them chewing young papers off the floor. I know that chewing gum's holding up most of these things. If it wasn't for chewing gum, how'd y'all be sitting in the floor tonight? And they're old and everything, but they're what God gave us, and we ought to take care of it. The bush is holy! You know what God said? Moses, throw that cigarette down. He said, Moses, take them shoes off. Moses, turn that TV off. He said, Moses, Get rid of that true story, modern romance, and secret confession. He said, Moses, you're on holy ground. He said, Moses, quit talking about the ball game. You're on holy ground. He said, Moses, quit talking about your wife's hairdo. You're on holy ground. She probably just got a permanent because she's Ethiopian and she had one that. These white girls going around and going to get them a permanent. You don't get a permanent. You get a temporary. Come out in a few months. Why are you calling it a permanent? So I'm going to the party next week and get me a temporary. That's what you should say. Because you don't get a permanent unless you're born with it. And I want to tell you tonight, Head Moses. This ain't the time and place for that kind of foolishness. You're on holy ground. I can say a lot there tonight. When you enter in these doors, you know how most churches have better service Sunday mornings than they do, I mean on Sunday night than they do Sunday morning? Because everybody's full up with the world all week long. You have to come in and preach the devil out of them Sunday morning. When we come back Sunday night, we're ready to have a time. That's right. When you come in that door and your mind's on the Lord and you got a song in your heart, you sit down and say, sing me a song about Jesus. Tell me about Him. But you know, there's some people, or if they'd have been Moses, they'd have said, Lord, how long is this going to last? <laughs> they sure would have. <laughs> Moses never would have got a blessing if he'd acted like that. Lord, the Lord has said, all right, if you ain't no more interested in that, go on. I'll get somebody else to do it. You know, there's some people can ever get a blessing when they come to church because the only reason they come is to get out. They don't come to get in. They come to get out. And if you come to get out, you'll never get in. But if you come to get in, you don't care when you get out. And Jesus, he looked at me. He said, well, you got here, Lord. What's going on? Now, Lord, if you're going to speak, speak, because at 9 o'clock, I've got to go to work. <laughs> or at 9 o'clock, the Bengals is playing the, the somebody, the saints, or the patriots, or the devils, or somebody. <laughs> I heard they went on strike. Glory, I always said stay on. Yeah, Them bunch of spoiled babies don't need no more money than what they're getting. My goodness, they're making ten times as much as anybody in the earth now, crying and boo-hooing and pouting around, wanting more money. We'd be better off just to pick up a bunch of those squads out here in the parking lot, let them play. Give them 20000 a year, you'd have a lot better games anyway. That old preacher out there at Mac Ford's camp said, you'd be surprised at the professional football players that wore pantyhose. 
<laughs> now you think about that just for a second. Some of you boys them your heroes. Plenty. That's the truth. He he said he was out in a certain city. I don't know. You remember what city he's talking about, brother? Brother Clark heard him preach that. He said he went into this certain store and he heard a man come in and said, it was a men's clothing store. And said, where do you keep your pantyhose? He said, what? He said, I didn't hear him right. And he went back in the store and said, sir, I don't know if I heard that man right or not, but did he say, where do you keep your pantyhose? He said, yeah, that's what he said. And he said, you don't have any, do you? He said, sure we do. I said, he said, for men? He said, yeah, we keep them right here under the counter. Different colors, you know. <laughs> and he said he found out that a large part of that pro football outfit was at Joe Namath, didn't he make a commercial and, and advertise for it? Some of you girls like Old Joe. I was at this woman's house one time. She had a picture of Bo Book on her wall. And she said, That's my fella. I said, I thought underneath my breath, I said, Sister, you better hope and pray to God it ain't never your fella. You ought to get you a good husband that loves you and takes care of you and works hard for a living, not run around on you every time your head's turned. That's what you need. But you know, the bush was a holy place. That means now anybody's welcome in the church. Now I know there's some churches where you ain't, but I try to make this church a place where nobody's barred from walking in them doors. As long as they conduct themselves right and don't try to talk, they just come sit down and listen. Brother, I don't care what they look like, how dirty they are, how bad their clothes are, they're welcome in this church. You say, I don't like sitting beside them. Well, you can leave. I want you to know they'll be welcome. But holy ground. And after you get saved and you realize it's holy ground, you're going to treat it holy. I mean, if you want to get up here in the choir and sing, you ought to be holy. If you're going to play the piano or take part in anything, you ought to be holy. I want to say tonight, that bush was a holy place. That's where the fire was. Let me show right quickly and I'm going to move on. I'm not going to hold it long. A Sunday school superintendent visited a man one time that had been out of church for a few weeks. And the man was saved and knew he ought to be in church, but he's missing, getting cold. So I went over and knocked on his door, and there he sat in front of the fireplace. He went in, sat down, and he didn't say a word. He sat down and looked out at that fireplace a few minutes. And he reached over and got those tongs and grabbed out a hot red coal out of the fire and set it out of the fire over here on the hearth. He set the tongs down. They sat there and watched it for a minute. And it went out. And he looked over at that old boy. And that old boy said, You don't have to say nothing. I'll be there Sunday. And he got up and walked out. There's a lot of people says, Oh, I can live just as good at home. If God's made it possible for you to go to church... And God, you've got the health to go to church and the way and transportation to go to church. You cannot live as good at home as if you can at church. You say, all these problems at church, I'll just stay at home. You can't do it. You can't, you hear me? You can't live as right at home as you can at church. I don't... Yeah! Well, there's been many times I'd like to just never come in here again. Somebody hurt my feelings or talk about me or something. I'd say, I'll just fool it with it. I'll stay at home and pray and stay right with God. I wouldn't do it. And you wouldn't either. You take that coal out of the fire, put it over here by itself, it'll go out in a little while. Remember the sign we had? Remember the banana? When it left the bunch, it got skinned. That's what'll happen to you if you quit church. The devil will skin your noggin, brother. It's a holy place. Not only that, tonight, 
Number five, through the bush, God made known His will to Moses. Yes, he did. See in verse number 10, He said, I will send thee unto Pharaoh. You know where Moses found out God's will for his life? At the burning bush. You know where most of God's children find out God's will for their life? In church, or around the church, hearing the man preach, being around the saints of God. You say, I can live just good at home. I tell you something, brother, there's just something about it. There's just something about it. Old TV preacher can't do it. Old radio preacher can't do it. There's just something about it when you get in with God's people and you see them all together. You see the Bibles under the arm. You hear them singing together. And when God's man preaches and people are good, there's something about that that gives you strength that you would not have otherwise. I want you to know, brother, this bush, God made known His will to Moses through the bush. Sure did. And I want you to know, you young people here tonight, the way you keep from messing up in life is stay in church. God will show you His will. God will show you the right person to marry. God will show you the right job to take. God will show you the right uh, about your family and how to lead and God. I found out one thing, brother. No matter what your question about life is, if you keep coming to church, the answer will come across sooner or later. I know people right now that quit church because they got confused. Lord God tonight, when you're confused, church is the best place and the safest place for you to be. Because right. as long as you're in here, the Lord can help you to get straight. But if you're out there, the devil will make a hamburger out of you. That's the worst thing you can do. You say, I'm going to wait till I get straightened out before I go back. Listen! 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 That's just what the devil wants you to do to wreck your life. Through this, God found out Moses revealed his will, or God revealed his will to Moses through the bush. God will show you his will through his church. Yes, I don't need a church. Well, I wouldn't say that if I was you. Through this, God's will was right quickly tonight. Number six, God, through the bush, God revealed to Moses the pitiful condition of the people. You know what he said there in verse number 7? He said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. He said, I see the mess they're in, Moses. Do you know where you get the true picture of the shape this world's in tonight? Yeah. You don't get it from AP or UPI or ABC, CBS or NBC. You don't get the true picture there. You get the true picture in the church. The book will tell you what condition man. Right. Somebody mentioned in the prayer room about down in Charlotte this week, Miss Gay America. You see any pictures of that? Anybody see the picture? All right, there's a few. Mike, some of the prettiest women you ever seen in your life. The only thing is, there's men. And there's up there dancing. Miss Gay America! And some preachers and some of God's people got down there and got to protesting that thing. And they put it on the news and made the preacher and the Christians look like the lawbreakers and the hellhazers. Sure did. They said, now all these people are stirring up trouble and they're going to open a Pandora's box of law questions. If they don't calm down, what in the world are they worried about the preachers and the Christians for? You get the true picture of this world. Unless you come to the house of God and get it through God's Word and His book. That's where you get the true picture. Through the bush, God revealed to Moses the pitiful condition of His people. I want you to know the Lord said the same thing. Look on the fields. Put out white under harvest. For His church, He reveals the pitiful condition of the people. Not only that, number seven. Number seven. The Bible tells us in verse chapter 3 and verse 8, Through the bush, God promised deliverance to His own. Through the bush, God promised deliverance. You know what He told Moses? He said, Moses, I am come down to deliver them. He said, Moses, I've I'm going to say to the children of Israel, I'm going to 
going to take care of you. I'm going to get you out of Israel. And I'm going to see you through. Moses learned that at this. Moses didn't learn that anywhere else. But he learned it at the bush. And did you know tonight? You know where you get comfort? Like they're saying about what, a while ago. Oh, what comfort they're in is in God's Word. Brother, tonight, the Bible tells us that God's going to see us through. God's going to see us through. The Lord's going to take us. You know what He told the children of Israel? He said, Moses, when you bring them out, they're going to come up and serve me on this mountain. You know where we have the hope tonight? The two words come up. Come up. Except in the New Testament, we got a hither on the end of it. Come up hither. Amen. And you know what I would about come up hither at? I sure didn't learn it watching old. Uh, I don't know what that guy's name is. That little sissy boy that wears leotards and got a bunch of fat women laying around in the floor trying to do push ups and stuff. You know, and said, Now touchy toes! Now touchy toes! I didn't learn it from him. Who'd you say? Richard Simmons. Oh, man, in here, but. You say, I don't believe in calling people's names. You need to read what Paul said. He's preaching about the Christians. One time he said the Christians are always liars. Simple, evil beasts, slow bellies. No, you ain't going to learn it like that. You know what I learned about come up here? In an old camp meeting, in an old church pew, with God's man up telling about it. I learned about the rapture. That's what I learned about the second coming. That's what I learned about it. I learned about the burning bush. Most of what I know at the Bible, see, I ain't that very smart. And I sure ain't very disciplined. I mean, I try to be, but something in me rebels against reading for hours and hours and hours. Thank God the Lord's allowed me to get to hear some of these preachers feet and teach me the Word of God. And he said the same, what I've taught you, the same commit to faithful men which shall be able to teach others also. They've been doing that ever since the apostles that came down to me and you. You can't improve on God's plan, son. You can't improve on it. You may not like it, you may not agree with it, but you can't improve on it. You know what old Moses could have said? He'd have said, I just don't believe that's the way it should be done, Lord. He went over here and found him an old dead bush and acted like he had something. But he wouldn't have had nothing, would he? He could have said, Lord, don't you think that fire is going to scare people? I can't get nobody to come up here, Lord, with that thing on fire. Lord, do you have to have all that commotion? I want to tell you something, folks. Real fire never has hurt anybody. There's been people come to our church, and you can tell when you see them, they're strangers. And I, I see them come in, seen a guy come in, sit about halfway back there in the middle, and he's real nice, sophisticated looking guy. Nice suit on, you know, and everything. And he went, I said, Oh, no. He's going to think we're a bunch of nuts. And the choir got up. I was hoping them boys wouldn't get started. Over. I, I'm ashamed to say that now, but I said, oh, Lord, don't let them start. <laughs> Some of them got a short fuse, too. But you know the Lord rebuked me for that. He said, listen, son, if it's real, it ain't going to hurt nobody. And people may not understand it, but they'll know there's something there. At least they won't go to sleep. And you know what? I've had some of those people when they come out the door said, well, I thought they was going to say, good day. <laughs> but instead, the Lord turned it around and they said, I really enjoyed that. And sometimes a tear be coming out of their eye. You know what I learned? Real fire ain't going to scare nobody. Hurt nobody. They'll be drawn to it. Now, wildfire will. 
I mean, my wildfire is bad. A guy told me one time, he said, you got a little wildfire in, in, his, in his church, you know? He said, I'd rather have a little wildfire than no fire at all. I said, uh-uh, not me, not me. I'd rather have no fire at all than wildfire. Amen. Moses could have said, Lord, people ain't going to like it if I talk to you here in this bush. They'll talk about me. My family will make fun of me. And the Lord said, well, what do you want? You want to talk to me? Or are you going to worry about what people think about you? Same question the Lord is asking you tonight. You say, I'd love to get in there and get saved. Feel what these people felt a while ago. I'd love to be a Christian. But I'm afraid what people say about me. Friend, it don't matter what they say. What they think, it's what God knows. And the question is to you tonight, have you been to that burning bush? If you saved, are you still going to it? The burning bush is a picture of a church on fire. You know what? Every member of this church would make up your mind right now that you'd say, God, Whatever it takes in my life, I want our church to be on fire. It wouldn't be long till the flame would burn so bright and so loud. People would just be coming in by the multitudes being saved. It's not God. He wants it. We don't, we don't believe. We're not hyper-Calvinist. We don't sit around and well, if the Lord wants to send them in, that's His business. If He don't, we'll just sit here and have a good time. I believe God wants to. I'm, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. God don't want them to go to hell. Don't blame it on Him. It's up to us to get on fire for Him. Let Him set us ablaze and we can be a church on fire. Let's stand together with our heads bowed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want them boys to come, that quartet, just a moment. Get ready to sing us a song while every head is bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed tonight. No one moving around. No one looking around. If God has spoke to your heart tonight and you say, Preacher, I'm a church member and I need to get on fire. You ought to just come tonight. If you're here tonight and you say, Brother Danny, I'm not saved. I need to let the burning bush of God set my soul on fire. You come tonight and God will save you. If you've never been saved, why don't you come and let the Lord save you tonight? Our Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, that you'd speak to hearts here tonight. Help our church to be a church that's on fire. And God, I pray, Lord, it will not quench it. will not throw cold water on it. But Lord, we'll let it burn for the glory of God. I pray a special prayer for that one that's here this tonight who's never been saved by Your grace. Lord, speak to that heart. Help them to come. Help them to make that trip to the burning bush before it's too late. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead, boys. While these boys sing tonight, why don't you just slip on out of your seat? Join these on this altar and say, God, I want my life to be on fire. I want to be a torch for you. Would you come? Would you come right now? We're just going to let them sing. You want to be on fire? If you've never been saved, if you've never been saved, why don't you come? Let the Lord help you tonight. If you don't know where you're going when you die, why don't you come right now? Would you come? How about it, friend? If you don't know where you're going when you leave this world, why don't you come on to Jesus and let him help you tonight? Don't be dead. Don't be cold. Let God set you on fire. No mortal tongue can air Come on, why are we saying what you can? Feels down deep inside when he yes, amen. Amen. Come and join these on the altar tonight. Somebody else, come on, come on, right now.
to the story that can never end. You'll never know. Amen. Man, that's right. Sing another verse. While they sing, if you need to come, come on right now. You may wonder just how I come on, come on. Why don't you let the Lord speak to you? So by your feet, come on right now. Come on, we only wait just a moment. Let the Lord have his way. Speak to your heart right now, friend. Come on, right now, while we say, I'll wait just a moment. You really know when it's happened. Amen. Amen. I'll be saying, won't you come? That's right. Oh, how it feels yes. deep inside That's right. when in your heart you live. Amen. How about it, friend? Even if I find the words, my friend, to the story that can never end, you'll never know and it will it happen to you. Amen. Say another verse, of course. No mortal tongue can ever describe the joy That's right. that Jesus gave. That's right. Oh, I Amen. Somebody else. Somebody else. In your heart you live. Amen. Even if I find the words, my friend, to the story that can never end, you'll never know. That's right. All right, I'm going to ask him to sing another verse of that in just a moment. Listen, you may be on the outside looking in and out. You may be looking out and say, I ain't never seen nothing like this before. You say, these people's crazy. But I'll tell you one thing, you'll never know till it's happened to you. There was a time you couldn't drag me into church. Sure, when you got me in one like this, I didn't like it. But I want to tell you something happened to me. Now I like it. I'm at home here tonight. My father's house. That makes all the difference right there. I don't feel out of place no more. I'm a part of the family of God. I've been an old green bush. I'll never forget that night at Nebo Baptist Church when I seen a bush on fire and I turned aside to see what it was and God spoke out of the bush. Tonight, if God spoke in your heart, friend, I feel like God spoke somebody's heart here that's never been saved. Maybe deep down in your heart, you're wondering, I just don't know, I just don't know, I just don't know. i tell you one thing, you'll never know until it's happened to you. If you've ever been saved, you'll know it's real. I want them boys to sing that last verse again. If God is speaking to your heart, why don't you just slip on out of that seat where you are right now. Come on down here. They'll be ready to pray with you. These preachers will pray with you. Somebody will show you the Scripture. You can be saved right here in this service tonight. You'll never have a better chance. Come on, right now. Come on. Come on, right now. Let God speak to your heart. Come on. Come on, right now. Why are we singing? Come on. Come on. Let God do a work in your life. He'll be really satisfied. How about it, friend? Come on, right now. Come on. You'll never be broken if you'll come. That's right. Come on. Come on. Why are we saying? Why are we praying? Oh, how it feels that deep inside.
Some are talking about their wealth and their riches. Some are talking about their trouble and strife. Well, I don't know how to talk like a rich man when compared I'm a beggar, no doubt. But if you're talking about that old-time religion, then I know what you're talking about. If you're talking about that old-time religion, then I know what you're talking about. That's the kind that will make you love your neighbor when old Satan will say, turn about. That's the kind that will comfort you in sorrow and it never fails to make you shout. And if you're talking about that old time religion, then I know what you're talking about. in my 